Now on the APEC VIP hotline, cutting edge training for the serious athlete, apecgo.com. Joining us now from baltimoreravens.com, the author of 10-Gallon War, the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future, John Eisenberg. How you doing, John? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much for coming on. First, before we talk about the book, you grew up in the Dallas area. How old were you when all this was going on between the Cowboys and the Texans? Well, I was a little kid. Uh, I uh, I was born in 1956, so I was six, seven years old, something like that, when the Cowboys and the Texans were going at it. And uh, I was, I will admit, my family sided with the Cowboys. Okay, so you're about my age then. So you you do have some memory then of uh, the Texans and and the uh, Cowboys being in there at that time, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I wasn't a teenager with real understanding of it, but yes, I went to the games then as a as a little kid. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, first of all uh, the uh, game and the the battle between the Chiefs and the Texans. First of all, what made you decide to uh, tackle this uh, subject? Well, I wrote a book uh, about fifteen years ago called Cotton Bowl Days. Uh, which was a book about growing up in Dallas in the early 60s as a Cowboy fan. And there was a chapter in there on the three years that uh, they spent battling over Dallas with, uh, with the Texans. Uh, the book was about the whole 60s when the Cowboys played the Cotton Bowl, but I, I had that one chapter in there. And uh, I was interviewed because of that chapter on uh, the Showtime documentary on the history of the AFL, Mm -hmm. and they interviewed me about that, and it just, my light bulb, the light bulb just sort of went off in my head. It's like, well, if if they think I'm really, uh, you know, an expert on this, (laughs) uh, it really deserves an entire book because it's such a great story, and so I just went at it from there. You grew up in Dallas. You personally knew some of the central characters in this story? Oh, absolutely, because uh, I did grow up, uh, went to high school there, and after college, I worked at the Dallas Times-Herald for five years. So uh, Lamar Hunt, uh, uh, you know, I covered his soccer team, uh, the the late, great Dallas Tornado. And so I I dealt with Lamar on a professional basis, and I I, uh, didn't live that far away from uh, Landry and Schramm and would see them out getting hamburgers, you know, and that kind of (laughs) stuff. So... Yeah, I was right in the middle of it. Okay, uh, t- so talk about, in addition to some of these central characters, uh, talk about some of the people you interviewed for this book. Oh, gosh. Well, I went back and, and uh, interviewed uh, everyone from then who was still around. Unfortunately, so many of them have, have passed away. But Jack Stedman, who was uh, uh, Lamar Hunt's right-hand man on the business side, the president of the Chiefs for many years ago, and going back to the Texans, I I interviewed him. Uh, the, the most familiar name with the Cowboys would be Gil Brandt, mm-hmm. who was their personnel guy for many years, is still around and, and writing actually for NFL.com. And so I had spent a lot of time with Gil and uh, a number of players, uh, particularly on the Texan side. Abner Haynes, of course, a very well-known name to anyone familiar with Texas football history. Abner is, uh, was a big help to me. I uh, spent some time in Kansas City and interviewed a lot of the guys that played for the Texans and then the Chiefs. Lenny Dawson, Fred Arbanis, uh, just a, a long list of guys. Talk a little bit about the uh, popularity level uh, at that time. Who was, you know, it's funny to think that America's team may not have even been Dallas's team back in those days. Well, that is the case. It was not. Uh, it was fifty-fifty, uh, right down the middle. Uh, when you look back on it, I mean, it's hard to say. Both teams played at the Cotton Bowl. They played on alternate Sundays. They fought over the dates, by the way, uh, to get the most attractive <laughs> dates. But they would play every other. One would be on the road, and the other one would be at home. And the crowds for both were not good. Uh, uh, the Cowboys were an expansion team. The Texans were in a new league that was just getting off the ground, and people in Dallas really throughout Texas, still like their college football more, UT and SMU and TCU and, and Baylor and everything. So the crowds were, were sparse. The, both teams were, were giving away tickets to, to try to get people to come to these games. You'd see ten or 12,000 people in the Cotton Bowl on a Sunday for a game that the Cowboys were playing. And uh, uh, the, it was split down the middle, I would say. I mean, the way it, the way it worked primarily, the way it broke down was the pe- young people went for the, the Texans. They were sort of the new, uh, you know, the upstart league. Uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit of, hey, it's the start of the 60s, a little bit of a rebel. 
And uh, the Cowboys uh, attracted more of the establishment, and they, they were from the NFL, the known quantity. And so I think the older people and, and the uh, establishment people went with the Cowboys. But it was, it was a 50-50 down the middle. Don't you find it fascinating, though, that uh, the way the Cowboys eventually captivated the nation, some of the personalities on the Chiefs team, uh, what became the Chiefs, would have been perfect. I mean, Lynn, for instance, uh, Hank Stram would have been perfect coaching uh, the Cowboys because he was as much uh, the the showbiz guy as Tex Schramm was, you know? Oh, absolutely. There was that was a those Texan that Texan team that that won the championship in 1962 was a great team with some real strong characters. Stram, really exuberant guy on the sideline as NFL films later captured and Abner Haynes was uh, was a real outgoing guy and Dawson. It was a dynamic young team that they had. But uh, they just never could catch on there. No, uh, the, the, I think the reality is it, it's like, and half the reason I wanted to write this book, uh, it's like an old western. You know, it's these, you got two oil families, and the town wasn't big enough for the both of them. You know, I mean, it's like they drew their guns and had a standoff. And so, yeah, the town was just not big enough at that point. Dallas could not support two teams, so they they just couldn't get over the hump. I mean, the Cowboys owned by Clint Murkison, took the long-range view, and they, 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 they were proved right in the end, and that was we, we're going to bring good people in here, which they did, Landry and Schramm, and we're going to work at building a team. We're an expansion team. We're going to grow it from the ground up, and when we do get good, they will come. And so they were just never going to leave. They were in the NFL, and uh, you know they had a business plan, and – so I think in the end, Lamar Hunt blinked is really what happened. And for the good of the league, uh, he said, i got to go somewhere where I am not fighting this. I can't fight. I can't, there's just not enough, not enough fans here. i got to go somewhere where the town is my own. And so that's when he went to Kansas City. I know it's impossible to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Imagine if this fight had taken place uh, in the year 2012 with some of the egos involved in ownership these days. uh, And, you know, when people are not looking out for the good of the league now like they used to, could you imagine what kind of uh, wreckage this could have caused? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, there's almost no way to correlate it because the NFL is so different today. And, yes, the egos... Uh, yeah, I mean, imagine Jerry Jones being involved in this thing, and and him being uh, where Lamar Hunt was. Yes, well, what would be great, and here is something to make people cowboy fans jump off off a cliff. Uh, <laughs> really, the way that it might work is if say, let's say Jerry owned two teams. No, you know, if no. Jerry owned two teams, and they played on alternate Sundays at that Cowboy Stadium. You know, it almost might work, but uh, uh, I don't know if he's running two teams. Maybe one of them would be half decent. Uh, I'm not betting on that one at all. No, not a chance. Now, what is one thing, you know, in doing all the research for the book, what's one thing that uh, really caught you by surprise or something that you learned that uh, just you nobody knew before this? Well, what I really learned was that, you know, if you read the book, the way the, way the NFL was so different, uh, it was really – uh, I mean, they had own they had owners and commissioner and all that. It was basically in the hands of George Hallis. George Hallis, the the longtime owner and and coach of the Bears, and of, of course a legendary figure in pro football history. He was running the NFL uh, behind the scenes and really charting its future. And he was the one that that brought the Cowboys to Dallas. There, there's no way around it. Uh, when Lamar started his team in the AFL, and he started it because the NFL would not give him, Hallis wouldn't give him a team. Uh, when he started the AFL, George Hallis manipulated everything behind the scenes to make sure that Dallas got a team, and that is how the Cowboys started. And then he made sure that Don Meredith came to the Cowboys. He drafted Meredith and traded him to the Cowboys. George Hallis did it all, and uh, I don't think people in Dallas really are aware of the impact that the old Papa Bear had on the uh, football future in Dallas. That's fascinating. Now, if the roles had been reversed and the Texans had won this war, do you think that the Texans would have become America's team instead of the Cowboys? Uh, no, I don't think. I think uh, the Texans were, were a good team. I think they would have been popular uh, if they had remained in Dallas, and, and that was the team in Dallas. I think they would have been great. Uh, and, uh, you know, they would have, they would have, they were successful in the sixties and seventies for sure. But I think what made the Cowboys America's team 
the, the, that franchise. I mean, if, you know, by, by this uh, model, then they would have gone somewhere. Let's say they were the Kansas City Cowboys. Uh, then they would have had Landry there and uh, Shram and uh, they were, who was the ultimate salesman, and they would have had Roger Meredith and Roger Staubach, and those that franchise would have had those players, and I, and I do believe that those are the people that made them America's team, not the city so much as the, the people that were involved with the Cowboys. So I think wherever they would have gone, I think they would have become a, a premier franchise. How long have you been in Baltimore now? Oh, boy. Now, there's a question. Uh, I left uh, Dallas Times-Herald in 1984. Okay. So that's 28 years ago, and I uh, figured maybe one of these days I'd get back to Texas. But 28 years later, I'm still in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, wrote for the Baltimore Sun for, for a quarter century. I was the columnist here in Baltimore, and, and now Ravens.com. All right. Uh, being a, a Dallas native and uh, having grown up, you left – after the Staubach years and the Cowboys in 84 were still, you know, obviously very, very uh, strong nationally. Uh, the Danny White years and all that, they were still a very competitive football team. Uh, can you believe, from your perspective, what has happened to this franchise? Well, no. I mean, it's sort of fascinating to me. I do follow them very closely. I mean, it's my childhood team. I have family there still. Uh, so I'm, I come back from time to time. And uh, no, it, it is hard to believe. It's 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 just I mean, I'm almost speechless because they are they're so they've never been more popular. I'll I'll tell you that. I mean when they when they came through Baltimore here, the Cowboys played here uh, last month. There were thousands of people in the stands, entire families of with Tony Romo jerseys on. Uh, you know, and I've seen them play on the road elsewhere, and that America's team thing uh, is still. It's still alive. I mean, people are fascinated with them and love them, but the team's just not very good, you know. And, and so it's sort of amazing to me that uh, they're stuck in this sort of cycle of mediocrity, but they've never been more popular. So it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a train wreck, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, I do follow it, and it, it's hard to avert your eyes. <laughs> yes, and it is a train wreck, and I think it's going to stay that way for a long time, too. Well, I, I guess so. I've run a, and doing a book tour around Texas. I've I've talked to hundreds, if not thousands, of cowboy fans. And you know, I, when I inscribe a book, I say, you know, hang in there. Maybe one of these days it'll get better. <laughs> oh, John, it's a great book. Uh, we really do appreciate you coming on with us today. We wish you the best of luck with it, and uh, we hope you come back to Texas someday. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed it. Great. John Eisenberg, the author of The Ten Gallon War. You can get it on Amazon.com and all the different uh, book sites and in your local bookstores as well. On Brian Houston Sports Radio Live on 99.3 Talk FM.